So guess what I am going to do for you lovely folks today while I am walking and drinking my green tea and my army thermos. I am going to do an overview of the book of Revelation. Now, it has been my experience that the first three chapters of Revelation are largely bypassed, which is a miss. Take. Why is it a mistake? Well, because the subject matter that you are going to encounter in chapters 4 and beyond are largely set up in chapters 1 through 3. The largest portions of my writing have come in Revelation 2 and 3, not just because there are seven different letters to each of the churches, one to each of the seven, the seven letters of the seven churches, <laughs> which deal with entirely different subject matter. But as I go through this, and from what I can remember from memory, there are significant number of concepts that are introduced uh, in those seven letters. So without further ado, let's start. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that has a blessing for those who read it, take it to heart. And I am of the opinion, after having studied this so extensively, and I do have a playlist for the book of Revelation. I've actually gone through it line by line three times on this channel. The first time I deleted it, but I'm going to guess the other two are still available. I actually did um, twice. <laughs> I have done a New Year's ring in with a uh, full study of Revelation from chapter 1 through chapter 22. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, um, if my son is not home, I'll do that again this next year. We'll see. I make no promises. But Revelation is the only book in the Bible that contains a blessing for reading it and taking the things written there into heart. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to understand every single word. And the reason I say that is not for lack of trying. It's simply for lack of reference points. There are going to be significant amounts of supernatural activity within the confines of Daniel's 70th week, much of which we just don't understand because the things which were uh, well predated our lives on this earth and there's just much knowledge that is lost, hidden um, about what happened millennia ago specifically with the fallen angels we know that they will return uh, in fact the beast that we will discuss is a fallen angel <laughs> So there's just a lot of supernatural activity that we have absolutely no reference point, no way to know. So we can guess about what certain things mean. However, we just won't have definitive answers and we really don't need them because we're not going to be here to experience it. But we'll get to that. Um, when I say hidden knowledge, I don't mean things that we, that God is like purposely obscuring, which a lot of people think is that for some reason God's just deciding to hide things. That's not what I mean. As I mean like the technology that the, the fallen angels had once upon a time that they used to build like all these ancient structures and um, you know the things that are depicted in hieroglyphics and stuff that they had a whole bunch of technology, some of that we have today. I mean there's like <laughs> scuba gear and helicopters and things depicted in the ancient hieroglyphics on like pyramids and stuff. They have <laughs> for, for as much of the world as thinks that they were like <laughs> people with hand tools built the pyramids. <laughs> no. No, they sure didn't. <laughs> um, there's just a lot that we don't know that is like buried underneath our feet that has been lost to time, weather, cataclysm, that kind of thing. So this, the 70th week, um, there is a lot of imagery that we can guess about in Revelation. 
fact of the matter is we are just not going to be able to conclusively say beyond a shadow of a doubt this is what that means we can guess we can speculate people do that make livings doing that i for one am a very literal uh, I, I take the very most literal approach to the study of the bible as possible if it says in ezekiel 38 and 39 they're going to be horsemen riding horses with shields and bucklers and swords. I don't say, oh, <laughs> Ezekiel didn't have a way to describe modern weaponry, so he really meant missiles. <laughs> I was like, no. If it says they're going to be on horses with shield and buckler and sword, then that's what's going to happen. Does that mean that there won't be other things also? Who knows? But if it says a thing, that is what it means. And we should not substitute our own thoughts for what the Bible says. You either believe it or you don't. And if you don't believe it says what it means, then why are you studying it? One of the things that I'll get to when we get to Revelation 7 is uh, I saw recently somebody said, oh, well, the 144,000 are going to be men and women. And it doesn't actually mean 144,000. There could be more or less. Okay. <laughs> You have no business teaching anyone anything if you cannot get this simple concept right. Very specifically says that they are men. It very specifically says that they are 12,000 from each of 12 tribes listed, which total expressly stated in scripture 144,000. If you cannot get simple details like those correct, you literally have no business teaching the book of Revelation at all. At all. <laughs> And people who would dare to believe you when you call the Bible false on its very specific statements uh, are dumb too. I didn't say that. I just thought it out loud. Revelation 1. The blessing for people who read it and take it to heart. This is because you have peace when you know the sequence of events and you know the things that are supposed to happen. It gives you peace. Mostly because the majority of the book of Revelation is for people, uh, who, well, people who aren't believers. You and I, if we're believers, we have peace because we won't experience these things. Um, in Revelation 119, John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Revelation 19.10 tells us that the testimony, uh, the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation is a prophetic book. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Jesus is called the I Am. He is also called in Revelation 1, he who was and is and is to come, the Almighty God. This is why Revelation is divided into three parts, right? The things which thou hast seen, he who was, the things which are, he who is, and the things which shall be hereafter, he who is to come, the Almighty. This is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And more specifically, it is a testimony to the events which will immediately lead up to his second coming. When people say that we don't preach the gospel of the kingdom, they are mightily in error. Because everything that we preach is ultimately forward-looking to the time when Jesus will set up his millennial kingdom on earth and we shall rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But more specifically, when he shall rule a righteous kingdom. It is a gift that he will share said rule with us. But the point is that he will rule a righteous kingdom that he will deal with all sin, all iniquity, and he will rule with an iron, a, a rod of iron, a righteous kingdom. This is what we should be excited about. As a side note, I will try not to go through rabbit trails. Revelation, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, She'll give me at that day. What day? Not the rapture, folks. The day that he will give those things is Revelation 22. 
Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. To give me at that day. The righteous judge is giving him the crown of righteousness at that day. When is Jesus the righteous judge? Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The day that we shall get our crowns is the day of the second coming. The righteous judge shall give the crown of righteousness. The righteous judge gives his rewards per Revelation 22 on that day, which is his second coming. And Paul goes on to say, and not to me only, but unto all them also who love his appearing. The appearing mentioned is in 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that he shall judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead, talking about spiritual conditions, at his appearing and his kingdom. His appearing and his kingdom is one clause, separated by no punctuation. His appearing is his glorious appearing, the day upon which he will return as the righteous judge to judge wickedness. And his rewards will be with him to give to every man according as his work shall be. Well, if we don't get the crowns until the second coming, what are the elders wearing in Revelation 4? Not those. So, Revelation 1. The salutation is given on behalf of all three persons of the Godhead. The one sitting on the throne, he who was, is, and is to come. And the seven spirits before his throne. That's the Holy Spirit. It's called the sevenfold spirit of God. The menorah in the earthly temple is a representation of the figures of the true in heaven. It is one candlestick with seven lamps. Seven lamps of burning fire, which are before the throne. My shoes like to come untied an awful lot. I should double tie them. But I don't want to. I want to be a rebel. Anyway. The salutations for the book of Revelation are given on behalf of God the Father, he who was, is, and is to come, and the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness of the dead, the first begotten of the prince of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God the Father. Even so, amen. So, then, John tells us that he's our companion in tribulation. Lowercase t, general condition that Jesus said in John 16, all of us would experience on account of being in the world and not of it. He was in the Isle called Patmos, 95 AD. And he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. In the Spirit is a reference several times made. You also see it next mentioned in Revelation 4. He heard uh, a door was open in heaven. He heard a voice as of a trumpet talking with him, saying, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Immediately he was in the Spirit. In the Spirit is a reference to receiving prophecy. We learn this from 1 Timothy 3.16. All, all uh, scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for rebuke, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And in 2 Peter 1, where it says... Uh, that all prophecy is given by inspiration of God. No, that's First Timothy. What does it say? Something about scripture. Oh, there is no prophecy of the scripture of, uh, of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in the uh, old times by the will of man. In the Old Testament prophets, it wasn't by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Revelation is a book of prophecy. And it's given by inspiration of God. So John is in the spirit when he's receiving prophecy. So I would challenge you to look up the times where in the spirit is mentioned in the book of Revelation. And you will note that he is receiving prophecy anytime that is present. Also noted, because Revelation 2 and 3 constitute the things which are, but every single one of the seven letters to the seven churches ends with, uh, an admonition to he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, 
John's in the spirit to receive a vision of the glorified Christ because he's in the, the spirit on the Lord's day, which is the second coming. In he hears a great voice of a trumpet behind him. The great voice of a trumpet on the Lord's day. This is Matthew 24, where it says, After the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give light, the stars shall withdraw their shining. Um, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Joel 3 right now, which is a sister passage to that. Uh, it says, After the tribulation of those days, Oh, then shall appear the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. The great sound of a trumpet. That's the same thing that Revelation 1 says. That John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, second coming, and he heard behind him a voice as of a, a great voice of a trumpet. The voice of a great trumpet. That's Matthew 24, second coming. And then he goes on to describe the vision of the glorified Christ. Revelation, he ends that chapter by telling us, is divided into three parts. The things which thou hast seen, that's the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in glory on the Lord's day, second coming. The things which thou hast seen, the things which are, which would be local to the present dispensation, and the things which shall be hereafter, which again is prophetic. We once again see the word hereafter appear in Revelation 4.1. So that very clearly tells you when the hereafter begins, Revelation 4.1. So the things which are, are your seven letters to the seven churches. The first is the letter to the church of Ephesus. What better concept would there be to start out teaching people with than love? The whole problem with the church of Ephesus, and I will say that I actually think it's quite hilarious. Are their shoes untied? I will double tie them now. Hold on. Wouldn't it be funny if I got hit by a car while I'm bent over tying my stupid shoes? It probably wouldn't be funny, but, you know, whatever. Um, the first thing that Jesus talks about is love. And isn't it funny that there are two letters that no rebuke is issued. Letter to the church in Smyrna, which is the second of seven, and the sixth of seven, which is the letter to the church of Philadelphia. And people are like, well, I got to put myself in one of the churches because you know the proclivity for us here in this church age is trying to make ourselves trying to make everything all about us it's like well I'm in the church so we're not the persecuted church so I can't be Smyrna but I'm perfect and there's no rebuke to issue me because I'm perfect so I must be in Philadelphia <laughs> well folks Ephesus was written to, the letter to the church of, the, uh, of Ephesus was written to a group of people who were entirely saved also. And they had a rebuke. And I dare say that if any of us deserve to be classified in any church, it'd probably be that one. Because the admonition is to return to the first love. This is not about Jesus. People think that the Ephesians lost their love for Jesus. No, because it very clearly states in that letter that they were very adept at pointing out false teachers and false doctrines. So they understood their scriptures and they were like, nope, you guys suck. Uh, you're doing it wrong and we don't want to listen to you. So go away. Except <laughs> the love that he was telling them that they needed to return to was loving thy neighbor as thyself. So maybe they needed to soften the way that they were rebuking false teachers and false doctrines. Not that they should stop, but that, you know, how you say things is just as important as what you say. The letter to the church of Ephesus is the only one that has a corresponding epistle called the book of Ephesians. And 
that book is all about love all about love so I uh, talked about it a great deal when I wrote that so the letter of the church of Ephesus is starting people off on the right foot and saying hey you guys need to remember to love your neighbor as yourself which is the second greatest commandment in the law they didn't have a problem loving God loving his word and therefore rebuking and reproving false doctrine and false teachers their problem was they didn't know how to talk to people talk to each other next is a letter to the church of Smyrna this is actually a very complex letter is what three verses long and it has four separate things that are being talked about the first is the importance of being heavenly rich even if earthly destitute the contrast of that is the letter to the church of the Laodiceans where they were earthly rich and heavenly destitute what's more important well Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6 he says lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal that's your Laodiceans lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven that's your church of Smyrna where moth and rust do, moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so they obviously had something going for them martyrdom uh, <laughs> not great on the martyrdom part because they were dying for their faith however this is where Daniel 1 comes in people have wondered greatly about the 10 days that I shall have tribulation 10 days Daniel 1 Daniel 1 it was when da uh, the Shadrach Meshach and Abednego Daniel I think all four of them could have been three but maybe all four can't remember Daniel 1 look it up they were brought to be part of the uh, group of elite and to keep them in good shape the king's men wanted to feed them the king's meat and drink and they're like nope we're not doing it we guarantee you that after 10 days we will eat what we normally eat and drink what we normally drink and we'll be better off because our God will make sure of it so 10 days they were put through a test and after 10 days they were better off than the ones who ate the great king's meat the king's great meat and great drink and all of that so that is representative of a period of testing after which a reward is given read Daniel 1 like I said do I have my Bible in front of me read Daniel 1 that's your 10 days as there was a test a trial that lasted 10 days and afterwards reward was given for passing said test because of faith in God be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life Daniel 1 that's your 10 days of testing there's probably other things in that chapter that uh, oh Ephesus uh, that's being overcomers well I give to eat of the tree of life which is the midst of the paradise of God the first thing that overcomers are guaranteed is the first thing that Adam lost when he sinned once we are taken to the heavenly throne room in our glorified bodies we will be reunited with the tree of life which Adam lost and had to be kicked out of the garden once he sinned lest they take of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever in a fallen state man was never intended to live forever in a fallen state so he had to be separated from the tree of life the very first thing overcomers are guaranteed is to have access to the tree of life restored once they are glorified next is the letter to the church of Smyrna we shall not be hurt of the second death then you have the letter to the church of Pergamos which is where we come to understand the white stone with a new name written and this is all about new covenant this is about the implements that were represented by the old covenant you have the physical temple with the instruments the lampstand which pointed to the seven spirits of God in heaven the uh, Ark of the, the Covenant which was the throne of God in heaven and in the Ark of the Covenant there were three things the hidden manna which is Jesus being the bread of life Aaron's budded rod which symbolized Aaron Levi as the tribe that God had selected for priesthood and uh, the tables of stone 
which in the New Covenant translates to the law written on hearts. So this is where we understand that what we're going to be talking about with reference to specifically Revelation 4 is talking about New Covenant. I will give thee a, a, a white stone with a new name written. Well, the name written on Aaron's rod was Levi. Aaron represented Levi. This is Numbers, I want to say 17. There's a story of Korah and the rebellion, and they thought that they could do better than the ones that God had chosen for the priesthood. So Moses was like, nope. <laughs> but God said, have each of the tribes lay out a, a branch or a rod with this, the name of their tribe written in it, and I will choose from among them. And the next day, he chose Levi's, Aaron's rod, and budded and produced almonds. So that is in the Ark of the Testament. So what he's saying, I will give thee a white stone with a new name written. White stone is used to symbolize approval. The sister passage in this is Acts 26, where Paul was telling them that he used to give his approval, or he withheld his approval. He cast a thumbs down for the Jews. Uh, just do a word study with the white stone and you'll see the reference in Acts 26 with Paul. The contrast of what God does for us is he approves us and Paul withheld his approval and he gave a thumbs down for Jews to be tortured, killed, persecuted, all that stuff. Um, the new name written. In the Old Testament, it was the tribe of Levi with the the rod that budded for Aaron, signaling that that was God's priesthood. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness and to his marvelous light, who in time past were not a people of God, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. First Peter 2, 9. We are a royal priesthood. And as overcomers, we get white stones signaling God's approval with new names written. Because we are not a priesthood from the tribe of Levi. We are a royal priesthood, sons of God, through Christ. This is also why Jesus in Revelation 19, uh, the rider on the white horse, has a name written on his thigh, which no man knew but he himself. On his vesture, on his thigh, he had a name written uh, that no man knew but he himself. Same thing as us. We get our own names written that no one will know but us. Letter to the Church of Pergamos. Can't off the top of my head think about what else was in there, but the important takeaways are overcomers. And Letter to the Church of Thyatira. This is where we get understanding that uh, great Tribulation is seven years, not three and a half. Great Tribulation to the nth degree is the last half. Called Great Tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. That's the second half. All seven years are Great Tribulation. Unbelievers cast into, and the contrast of that is, Believers come out of or kept out of per the promise in Revelation 3.10. The contrast is shown in Revelation 7 with the multitude that no man can number having come out of great tribulation. Yeah, they weren't in it. <laughs> That's the whole point. They were kept from it because per the letter of the church in Thyatira, only unbelievers are cast into. I'm going to stop this video here because I'm already at a half hour and I will resume talking about the book of Revelation in other videos. Somebody almost just hit me. That's great. Yay for my stupid neighborhood. Anyway, um, I will resume in the next video segment with Revelation 3. See you later.